Pope Francis is set to proclaim five new saints during the extraordinary missionary month of October. In this special episode, we'll explore the lives of the theologian, convert, and cardinal, John Henry Newman, two mystics, Swiss laywoman Marguerite Bays and Indian sister Mariam Teresia, and two charity workers, Sister Dulce Lopez from Brazil and Sister Giuseppina Vanini from Italy. John Henry Newman was born in February of 1801, at the end of the Age of Enlightenment and the beginning of the Romantic Era. He grew up in a pious Anglican household. The eldest son of a banker in London, he was a great reader at school, especially of modern philosophy. At the age of 15, his last year at school, he converted to Evangelical Calvinism. Newman's intellect destined him for Trinity College at Oxford University, where he studied classics but he suffered from burnout due to overwork and performed badly on his exams. Despite this, he was elected a fellow of Oriel College and he began teaching there. But at the same time, he is uh, a man like most fellows of Oxford Colleges at the time who becomes a clergyman in the Church of England. He's ordained in the Church of England as an, uh, an Anglican presbyter in 1825 and becomes uh, vicar of the University Church, the Church of St. Mary the Virgin, which belonged to Oriel College. Uh, with the office of vicar of uh, St. Mary the Virgin comes responsibility for this place, for Littlemore. In 1839, Newman came to live at Littlemore, buying and converting a rundown property, which he turned into a retreat house working out his future in prayer and study. He wrote letters to those considering conversion, inviting them to Littlemore and asked them the question, do you believe the claims the Catholic Church makes for itself? He built a church and a school at Littlemore, following a call to serve the community, which repeated itself later in his life. He started to follow the Oxford movement. Newman wrote a doctrinal publication or tract to reconcile the 39 articles of religion of the Church of England with the Catholic theology of the Council of Trent. Newman now found himself rooted in the early church fathers, and having tested the Church of England doctrinally, he had found that it had failed. On the 9th of October, 1845, in a library in Littlemore, Newman became a Catholic. Blessed Dominic Barbary was coming to Oxford to visit one of Newman's friends who had become a Catholic two weeks previously no idea that Newman was going to ask to be received. When Barbary arrives in the middle of a rainstorm, in fact, on the 8th of October, Newman asks to make his submission to the church and spends two days making his confession. It was very interesting, really, because um, when, when um, Newman first became a Catholic in 1845, he wasn't immediately sure exactly what he's going to do, even to the point of not being sure whether he would be a priest. Um, I think that was probably just wisdom on his part because he knew that you can't anticipate the judgment of the church and the vocation. It has to be the church that decides. So he may have been thinking about various possibilities, including um, the, 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 the possibility of joining an existing religious order uh, because he reckoned that if he were to be ordained as a, as a secular priest, he would have been on his own. Uh, he would have been separated from his friends with whom over the years in Oxford and Littlemore and Maryvale, um, after his conversion, he'd been used to uh, working closely. It was, it was Bishop Wiseman, as he still then was, who said, you ought to look at the oratory. The oratory meant they could live in a city, they could minister to different people, exercise different talents, but still cultivate that spirit of friendship which had brought them together. On the face of it, St. Philip and Newman are not very similar characters. Newman can certainly seem a rather serious character, though I think in private he was very humorous. But on the surface, he's quite a serious character, whereas St. Philip was always laughing and joking. He's the saint of youth and the saint of joy. But what they both have in common is drawing people to God through friendship. The later part of his life was a period of tranquility and religious opinions, which enabled him to produce his best works, writing prolifically in prose, poetry, and hymns. In 1879, having been made cardinal, he chose as his motto, Cor ad cor loquitor, or heart speaks unto heart. That's a, a motto that 
actually comes from St. Francis de Sales, the great 16th century French saint and spiritual writer and bishop, writing for lay people. And he suggests that this is the nature of contemplative prayer, of mystical prayer, where the heart speaks to heart. And St. Francis de Sales says, in the silent conversing between lovers. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of language that Newman chose as his motto as a cardinal. And it synthesizes, it brings together the intellectual, the religion of the head, and the religion of the heart. On the 11th of August, 1890, Newman died of pneumonia and was buried, according to his wishes, in a tomb where his remains would decay as quickly as possible to nothing. Uh, on his gravestone, he had the Latin tag ex umbra imaginibus in veritatem, out of darkness and images into the truth. He believes first to last from his first conversion in 1816 and to his death in 1890 in a religion that is a religion of truth, not opinion, but a religion that has to appeal not only to the head, but to the heart. After the break, we'll introduce you to the lives of two largely unknown mystics, Blessed Marguerite Bays and Blessed Mariam Theresia. Marguerite Bays dedicated her life to the care of the family unit, to prayer and to parish community, in simplicity. She never took religious vows. She was born on September the 8th, 1815, in La Pierras, a small village in the Swiss canton of Freiburg. Marguerite chose what was considered to be an unusual life for that time in history. She decided to remain a single laywoman, completely dedicated to prayer and service, without entering any religious community. For her entire life, she remained a third order Franciscan. Father Carlo Caloni, a Franciscan Capuchin in Rome, is general promoter of Marguerite's cause for sainthood. She was also invited by her spiritual directors to follow a path of consecration to become a nun. She always thought that instead it could be very fruitful, very full of God's grace to dedicate herself as a consecrated, let's say, lay person remaining in the family, serving in the family, but also serving in the parish. She was a catechist. She also followed the young women who had to form a family. So she had a great experience that came to her from the deep relationship she had with Jesus. So an apostolate, we can say, lay. Marguerite Bayes was diagnosed in 1853 with advanced cancer. Rather than pray to be healed, she asked the Virgin Mary to be able to suffer with Jesus. On September the 8th, 1854, Marguerite's 39th birthday, the day Pope Pius IX proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, she was miraculously healed. From that moment on, after Margarita was healed of her illness, in a completely inexplicable way, she became an announcer of the Lord's passion. Every Friday she had these moments of suffering in which there was blood and the stigmata, the very pain of passion. Practically, Margarita was joining the passion of Christ on Calvary. Every Friday she helped, she brought to fruition the passion of Jesus for the whole world. Marguerite died on the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, June the 27th, 1879. She was beatified by Pope John Paul II in 1995. La Beata. The blessed soon-to-be saint, Margarita has had some miracles attributed to her. For the canonization that we are bringing, one such miracle was approved, that miraculous intervention of intercession by Margarita on a child of about two years, who inexplicably fell under the wheel of a tractor that weighed approximately 850 kilograms. La bambina, dopo che la ruota la 
After the wheel passed over the entire length of her body, the child, about 80 centimeters tall at the time, comes out unharmed. The doctors, after she is taken to hospital, can only see that this little girl is well. Altro che constatare che questa bambina sta bene. She lived a simple life as a dressmaker and wove her life into that of the divine with strong threads of love for all of her neighbors. The life of Mother Mariam Teresia was characterized by an intense personal love of God and care for the family unit. Mother Mariam Teresia was born Marth Teresia in Kerala on April the 26th, 1876. From the time of her childhood in Kerala, India, she was deeply impressed when her mother spoke about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Father Benedict, the promoter of Mother Mariam's cause for canonization, says that contemplation of the Passion of Christ gave Mariam Teresia's life direction. Uh, she used to ask her mother repeatedly, why did Jesus have to die for us? And she said, if he suffered so much for us, for me, I should also respond to her. So she started a lot of life of penance, penitential life, as a child itself. And uh, I think her whole life was uh, kind of responding to God's love revealed in the person of Jesus on the cross. She deeply desired to suffer as Christ had in order to be closer to him and therefore cared for the poor, the sick, and the dying, even going against common Indian morals in order to do so. She was known to have cared for those suffering of measles and leprosy. She had a special charism for the family unit as she was convinced that if a family unit is healthy, there will be many more happy and healthy people in the world. It has, a, it has a biblical background. Jesus sends out people, his disciples to go to all over the world, go to the people, and not, not wait there for people to come to you, but go to the people. Mother, uh, Maria Teresa followed this example. So she could be, a, she would go to any and every family, the poor, the rich, and the outcast, and the high caste, the noble, every family, and then just listen to them, and uh, uh, be, help them in, many, in several ways. Mariam Teresia is a mystic of the 20th century who is largely yet to be discovered. Similar to Teresa of Avila, she had frequent ecstasies and levitations. In 1909, she received the stigmata, but along with these mystical experiences also came demonic attacks. She was not properly understood by church authorities. Mariam Teresia underwent several exorcisms. These mystical experiences became an obstacle for Mother Mariam to open the religious congregation that she desired. Finally, on May the 14th, 1914, with the permission of the bishop and under the guidance of her spiritual director, now Venerable Joseph Vitwati, she founded the Congregation of the Holy Family. Sister Vinaya and Sister Rose from the Congregation of the Holy Family continue the legacy of their founder. After founding the congregation also, she worked for the poor people, for the families, uh, etc. And that is uh, what we are doing now, it's, uh, now also. We are going to the families. Our main charism is uh, family apostolate. The congregation is spread throughout the world from Africa to America with over 1,500 professed sisters and 176 houses. She, has, she had a passionate love for God and uh, a compassionate love for the families, for the people. So we also have this charism to carry the compassionate love of God to the families, to the persons, through family apostolate. Mother Mariam Teresia was beatified by Pope St. John Paul II in 2000. On February the 12th of this year, Pope Francis recognized the miracle attributed to her intercession. The child was dying. The doctor called the parents and uh, one said, you can inform the, your relatives because child, there's little hope. And uh, the grandmother at that time, she was uh, not keeping well, but she came with a relic of uh, Marian Theresia. 
and uh, she came there and uh, asked the nurse, uh, a nurse who belongs to the same congregation of the Holy Family, to place the relic near the child's head and pray, and uh, she did that. Christopher began to breathe normally, and never since has he suffered similar problems with breathing. I think the, the first lesson that we, um, that we all can learn from her is uh, the way in which God loves us in a way very personally. And the second thing is fearlessly going to the people to speak about God's love. As Pope Francis used to say, used to say very often, we had to go to the peripheries, especially where the, peop the poor people live, and share with them the love which we have experienced. Learn with us about two mercy workers, Blessed Sister Vanini and Blessed Sister Lopez. A two-time Nobel Prize nominee, a woman who built the biggest charitable organization in all of Brazil, an icon of charity for the 20th century, Sister Dulce Lopez. Thanks to a life dedicated to Christ and small acts of love, she will now be officially recognized a saint. She was born Maria Rita Lopez on May the 26th, 1914 in Salvador de Bahia, Brazil. Sister Dulce began her ministry of small acts of love at 16 when in the basement of her house she hosted poor children and elderly. At the age of 18 she joined the Missionary Sisters of the Immaculate Conception of the Mother of God where she continued her service to the poor. Once Sister Dulce had to look for a shelter for 70 of her patients who were kicked out of a previous building where they were housed. The Mother Superior gave the convent's chicken yard to Sister Dulce and asked her to take care of the chickens as well. Sister Dulce chopped them all up and fed her patients a delicious chicken meal that day. Once a hen house, now St. Anthony's Hospital. Today, more than 3,000 patients are treated here every day. Sister Dulce continued performing her small acts of love and established a Catholic syndicate, a library, a school, and even three cinemas. In 1959, she founded the Charitable Works Foundation of Sister Dulce, which continues to be one of the most well-respected charitable organizations in Brazil. Between 1979 and 1980, she had the opportunity to meet a fellow saint in Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and she also met Pope St. John Paul II twice. The last meeting between the two occurred before she passed away on March the 13th, 1992, after a 30 years long respiratory illness. As part of her beatification process, Sister Dulce's body was examined and found to be incorrupt. She was beatified on May the 22nd, 2011, and in 2016 was chosen to be one of the official patron saints of World Youth Day in Krakow as a model of charity. Soon-to-be Saint Giuseppina Vanini will be patroness of hospital workers and suffering people. She was born in Rome on July the 7th, 1859, the second of three children. From childhood, Giuseppina dealt with many sufferings, illness, and poverty. At the age of four, she lost her father, and at the age of seven, her mother. Separated from her siblings, Giuseppina grew up in an orphanage near St. Peter's Square on the Janiculum Hill. The promoter of Giuseppina's cause for canonization, Sister Bernadette, knows the life of Blessed Vanini better than anyone else, and she tells us that the experience of living with the sisters helped Giuseppina to choose the consecrated life.
crescendo con le suore della carità, growing up with the sisters of a charity, on the day of her first communion, she felt the desire in her heart to become a nun herself. When she reached the age of 21, she asked the sisters to join the institute. She was admitted and then later discharged after several unfortunate circumstances. She was then sent back several times and finally discharged for good. Blessed Vanini never gave up the desire to consecrate herself to God. She continued with the search until she met chameleon father Luigi Tezza. God, who permitted Giuseppina to suffer, chose her to alleviate the sufferings of others. Il Tezza, in questo momento, um, Father Tezza at this moment felt an inspiration from God saying, is this not the young woman you are looking for to start the female branch? He proposed to Vanini to be the founder. The encounter with Father Tezza was the turning point for Mother Vanini's life. After two years under his spiritual guidance, on February the 2nd, 1892, Blessed Vanini consecrated herself to God. Sister Laura runs the mother house of the Chameleon Sisters community in Rome. She walks us through Blessed Vanini's room that has now been turned into a museum. This museum, we some no? This museum collects some particular items. For example, in this luminous and open cross, we have the very first timetable of the sisters. The cross, the red cross. This cross was placed on Mother Vanini's dress by Father Luigi Tezza on the day of her profession. And here, written by the hand of Giuseppina Vanini, is a comparison with Adam and Eve. Just as the rib was removed from Adam and Eve was created, so the worthy son of St. Camus, Father Tezza, removed the Red Cross from himself and presented it to Mother Vanini to give life to the daughters of St. Camus. Since that moment, the community grew very quickly, and today there are 800 sisters working in 22 countries across four continents. Her charisma is strongly present here at the Giuseppina Vanini Hospital in Rome. Sister Reggie walks us through the hospital chapel and explains the duties of the sisters. The speciality of chameleon charism is to serve the sick even at the risk of our life. This consists one of the main aspects of our mission. That is to take part of the healing ministry of Jesus, which we read all through the gospel. The head of the cardiological department, Professor Gerardo Anzalone, is proud to show the brand new intensive care unit. And this care intensive coronary unit is the newest and the most modern in Rome. Uh, it consists of nine beds um, provided with the safest monitoring system technology, which allows to follow in real time, uh, the vital parameters uh, for each patient in order uh, to immediately detect uh, life-threatening arrhythmias uh, and our cardiac arrest. The successful mission of Mother Vanini today, however, is the fruit of her battles with so many obstacles in the past. There have been so many difficulties. To begin with, for example, the Pope who didn't want the new foundations in Rome, he must have had his reasons, but the Institute was forming, and when the request for approval was presented twice, it was denied. So the Institute was first developed as the so-called Pious Association. Mother Vanini didn't live to see the fully recognized religious congregation. Moreover, the faculty of confession was taken away from her spiritual father and friend, Father Tezza, and he was forbidden to meet the sisters. He was consequently commissioned to work in Peru, thousands of miles away from Rome. He never returned to Italy. Subsequently, as it often happens in the lives of the saints, there were accusations against the founder, unfounded accusations, but he did not defend himself and chose to be silent. 
This was a great suffering for the Blessed Vanini, who had to carry out the institute that had just begun. She trusted the Lord and said, There are times when I feel completely alone. Only surrendering to God gives me the strength to move forward. She knew that this was his work. Father Tetza's legacy has since been vindicated. Today he's recognized as a blessed himself. Mother Giuseppina Venini died at the age of 51 on February the 23rd, 1911, leaving behind her example of perseverance, care, and love for the suffering. Mother Venini was beatified by St. John Paul II on October the 16th, 1994, and was able to be canonized because of the miracle involving Brazilian construction worker Arno Klauck, who fell down an elevator shaft. It happened in the north of Brazil, in the state of Mato Grosso. A worker fell from the third floor of a building under construction, about 11 meters deep, and after the fall was not injured at all. Mother Venini's simplicity in daily life, faithfulness to God's call, and abundant love for those who suffer led her to the glorious throne of God.